The general idea of, about what I will talk about is uh, in, in the schematic here. We would like to look at some trapped particles here and their interference patterns. We're looking at intensity images. And the information about the trapping here is all contained in these intensity interference fringes. Um, and then we want li would like to do some phase retrieval to actually reconstruct the complex amplitude and phase field in the object plane. And from this, we can then use the Maxwell stress tensor to calculate local forces on individual particles and also local torques on individual particles. So that's the general idea. And uh, I will show you in my talk how we do that and what it is good for. Well, as you all know, um, um, optical tweezers are a great thing and they have been uh, there has been an, a recent Nobel Prize in, fix, in Physics awarded to Art Ashkin on, on optical tweezers. And this is not just because it's just a nice tool to catch things and move them around, but basically also because uh, this is, is, is a quantitative thing. So one can really do a, a quantitative measurement in the picconewton uh, range, where you have in the in microscopic world, you can have like a a calibrated scale where you can measure forces and that sort of uh, picanewton range. And, um, and there are uh, a lot of a lot of uh, calibration um, methods, how you can actually make this quantitative. And uh, there's a wealth of these methods around, but a large variety of these available methods, they use the position or the trajectory uh, of uh, the particle that they record. So you have a photo quadrant diode or something, you displace the particle or, or move the traps and you look what's happening. You can also do things like you watch the Brownian motion and fit it to a, a Brownian motion theory. You can look at autocorrelations or you can apply Stokes law. Where, um, if you bring the particle to, to settle into a trap, to move into a new position of the trap. You could uh, you can take the, the Stokes law of motion in, in, a, in a, um, a friction and um, uh, uh, in a liquid with friction and fit it to that. But most of these um, force calibration methods, they need a little bit of information you have to put in. So very often you need prior knowledge of some parameters that are not so easy to access. So the size of a sphere, maybe you can estimate, but sometimes it's really hard to tell what the local viscosity of the liquid will be, especially if you want to do in situ measurements, like you want to do a force measurement inside a cell of a, of a, a particle that is has been gobbled up by a cell or inside or uh, or is a, a vesicle inside a cell. So then it's difficult to guess um, these parameters you would need for the fit. And a lot of the, the like the Stokes law, or if you if you sort of correlate it to results from uh, calculated from Lorentz Me theory, is always the assumption of a spherical shape, which is very often not the case. And also posi position detection may not be adequate for particles of a very complicated shape. Uh, what projection do you see? What do you actually see uh, on, on the photodiode? And you might have to need recalibration for every individual particle. So uh, there have been ideas around to get uh, a more direct uh, force calibration by just directly going to the very simplest principle one can think of. So a really, really simple idea of direct force measurement is just to, to keep in mind that according to Maxwell theory, um, there is a ingoing, the ingoing momentum is related to the local uh, K vectors. So the local momentum uh, um, of, the, of the light, the propagation direction, and can be calculated as a linear momentum uh, from Maxwell stress tensor. And uh, if you want to know what's the force acting, the optical force acting on a particle in a trap, you do something, change the forces. So, so you can do this by keeping balance of ingoing momentum versus outgoing momentum. So if you know the rate of change of the linear momentum of the optical uh, field, then you can use um, something as basic as Newton's first law to calculate the forces that must have acted on the particle. So the idea is very simple and has been around 
conceptually for a very long time. For example, Carlos Bustamante, in his very early and very nice paper here, he speculated about doing this approach. And it's actually taken a while to, to really uh, do this uh, in, in practice in a feasible, precise, and practical way. And um, these people here from Barcelona were the, four, the first people who published a longer paper or the, or on this in uh, 2010. And uh, um, a little bit later, we have looked into this and uh, modified it a little bit to make it fully three-dimensional. So we also get the Z component or the actual component. Why is it difficult to keep track of all the ingoing momentum? One has to characterize well, what's the momentum that goes in? But then the important thing on the other side, you really have to capture all the momenta that come out. So that is not quite so easy. And why is it not so easy? This is a, a quotation, from, a citation from uh, Carlos Bustamante's uh, paper. Basically, it says, it's difficult to do this balance of ingoing and, and in, incoming and outgoing momentum, because if you want to confine the particle, if it, you, you, you have to confine it very well with a high NA, but that means, of course, that here we have very high angles that you need to capture. Otherwise, you will lose momentum and you will miscalculate. And if you reduce those cones and make them um, more like a collimated beam, then you have problems with the gradients in the trap. So it will not be confined. The particle will leave the trap. So it is, in fact, difficult to, to, to have uh, such lenses, which will give you a, a precise enough estimate of all these outgoing uh, momentum here. You have to be able to capture basically everything that is in the forward direction. But it is possible, and uh, one can use a, a high NA ob objective lens to form the traps in combination with a um, with an SLM, with a spatial light modulator. You can do holographic uh, optical tweezers, so several traps, and then you have a high NA condenser that converts, it picks up all the light scattered into the forward direction and maps it in, into uh, onto the camera plane. And uh, so in the back focal plane uh, of the, where the camera sits, all these scattering angles in different directions are converted into a position, radial position away from the optical axis in the camera plane. So if you make an intensity measurement of, of the light being scattered in the, for, in the far field where the camera sits, so we do this, of course, by the lens, which has the Fourier optics. Then you can have uh, this formula. You can calculate from Maxwell theory. So you measure the intensity distribution. You calculate this integral. And then you can calculate a rate of change. So if this is the initial uh, forces, and you can add, um, get the, the change from uh, a, the rate of change of this e expression in here. So it is is possible to do a direct uh, force measurement from a single intensity measurement. The limitation, of course, it might not be suitable for all particles that you have in there. If you have a strong backscattering, for example, there is no way you can capture that contribution. But in this case, it, either if it's a somatic uh, type of scattering pattern, which you already know, you can make an estimate how much they uh, will be lost that you cannot actually capture it because it's going backward. Or if that's not really possible, if there is no symmetric scattering and, and you have a general situation, uh, you need to look at it from a dual beam approach, maybe. So you look in, you have a second setup where you have a second camera and you look at it from both directions. That's a bit more expensive, but in principle, it would be doable. So it was already quite some years ago that we implemented this um, direct force measurement and have applied it also to se several cases. Now, this is an error force uh, in pico Newton, so you can see the green line is after some systematic error that we correct what we know from our optical setup and what we know that we lose because it's going backward, that we can estimate that from the optical components and so on. And we see it can be really close to, uh, to it's a very good uh, force calibration that you cannot within a, a fraction of a pico Newton that we get in, in precision. So this is, is really a, a feasible and high precision quantitative method you can create this way. And now recently, um, in a follow-up 
uh, uh, project to our, this was done in my advanced, ESC advance grants from several years ago, and in a follow-up uh, project from our National Science Fund, Gregor Thalhammer, and our PhD student, Franziska uh, Strasser, and myself have generalized uh, this idea to look into more complicated situations. For example, if you have even uh, more difficult particle shapes or you want to assign the forces to several trapped particles that are in different spots and in, in different trapping spots, or if you have very complicated environments. So this is a bit more challenging than just have a single or, or a bead in a trap where you do this direct force measurements. And I'd like to show you a few examples on, on this more generalized thing, in particular individual traps where you want to know the forces of acting on one individual particle. Why is that interesting? Many people do really very interesting and nice experiments by attaching beads, for example, to uh, to DNA or to actin filaments or to several sites on the plasma membrane of cells. And then you push them into various directions. So we have um, attached at multiple spots and you pull with forces uh, that you can vary in multiple directions. Then, of course, a method which will only give you the overall force acting on the particle, which could, in fact, the, be zero because the resulting force is zero. If you pull semantically, that is not very informative. You'd really want to have something where you grab one spot here, you pull there, even without the beat, you're just putting a spot on, you exert the force and really like to know what the local force here on this part of the cell would be. And, and the local force here and not just the total force. And our direct force measurement is able to do that in a, in a very precise and calibration-free method a way. And this is also how, how the inverse problem and the phase retrieval comes in. So the goal is to assign forces to individual traps in here schematically. And we are recording in the far field where the scattered trapping, the, the trapping light being scattered by all these various particles in here, it overlaps. It interferes, and we're looking at the in, in, in interference pattern. So in the back focal plane, in the far field, where the camera sits, we have information about the position of the individual scatterers. It's all contained in the face there. On the other hand, we are recording the, the intensity only, the, the interference pattern. But we would need the complex field and amplitude in the object plane uh, to reconstruct, uh, the, the, to, rec to calculate the force from the Maxwell stress tensor in this in this uh, plane that we're interested in, uh, in whether the particles sit. So basically, we need some kind of a phase retrieval to establish what is the complex field here, and we propagate back and forth to establish what the complex field in amplitude and phase is over here, between the back focal plane and the object plane where the trap the trap sit. So we'd like to have a phase retrieval that is robust and give us reliably and fast uh, the, the, the complex field in the object plane from a single intensity in the far field. How do we do the experiments? First, before I show you the, what needs to be done in the inverse uh, problem. So um, what we have here, we are realizing this by holographic optical tweezers. So we call it also a holographic uh, direct force measurement because we're using here a spatial light modulator. And uh, there you put a phase pattern on and you assume an input field that you, uh, that you know, but you will uh, shine on the, the spatial light modulator in this sense. The spatial light modulator does a computer generated hologram and creates these spots over here. This is very famous and everywhere. It is ubiquitous almost in, in the trapping community because you can easily reconfigure the traps. You can move them around and then the particles uh, stay in there and can be transported and, and this sort of things. Um, and then we have just some optics that is just relay optics. But the important thing is over here. So we have here, that's the back focal plane of the objective lens. We have the objective lens sitting here. In the spot, the single beam uh, laser traps form. So this is where we have the, the, the focus uh, here where the trapping happens. And then we have the condenser lens. 
that picks up all the scattered light and converts the angles then eventually in a position on the camera plane here. There's some extra lenses there. And uh, the inverse problem um, is actually formulated only in this a rect rectangle here in yellow. All the other things are just technical terms for the experimental setup. For conceptually, uh, the important thing here is the back focal plane of, of the uh, condenser lens, which corresponds to the far field. We bring them to the camera somehow to measure the this, this in this plane here in the back focal plane, as well as the object plane, the trapping plane. So it's only going back and forth uh, numerically in the inverse problem, the other things don't really concern us so much. And you can see these objective lens and oil condenser lens, they are high NA, they have a really high numerical aperture, meaning they are high quality lenses, which also cost a little bit, of course. Now, the intensity images that we get, um, these are two examples here. This is a back focal plane intensity pattern for empty trap and how it changes when a single trap bead is is scattering is scattering the um the light uh, is scattering the light and we get an interference in the overlap now you would would say what are these uh, structures that we can see here now this is a kind of a dark field um imaging that we do here we are closing an aperture stop somewhere further uh, further below before the the objective to, uh, um, to make visible some effects that we have here uh, from the SLM. If we open the full aperture stop as wide as we can and we collect everything that is uh, coming from the SLM, which does a, a pure face, uh, a face shifting pattern only, then we would just have an image of a, a, a transparent face pattern. And it would be just, it would, should be the, the image of the full open uh, empty aperture, it should be all bright. But when we are closing the aperture stop a bit, we can see some structures coming from the SLM. So they're not the, the real thing, the interference pattern. We see a ring in the middle here, which comes from the, is a fabri perot effect, uh, comes from the uh, liquid crystals uh, layer with a, um, anti uh, reflection coating. And then we also can see some wrap lines uh, um, here. These are uh, pi over two and pi wrap lines in the pixels, which scatter out a little bit of a light because there's a big step in the in this uh, digitized uh, pattern and they scatter a little bit light out to the side, which we don't capture here. And uh, this is too far out or back. And, and this, um, and this shows up as these uh, structures here. Now, if, um, as I said, if we, this is just to show you that there are some artifacts there, but the important thing, even though we have some artifacts and some features that come from the spatial light modulator, these things are constant. They always be there, they don't affect uh, the performance of the face retrieval because they are just a constant, never changing uh, thing that is there always. And we're looking at changes or differences. So this seems to cancel out. It doesn't make a difference. So this is the change that you induce by having it a full trap and only the difference between the two images is what matters. Now, how do we do the, the face retrieval? So again, the inverse problem is to find the complex field in the object plane. After numerical propagation um, um, to the far field, and uh, which describes the observed far field interference pattern. So we 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 have to we we look at um, we we have the the trapping plane here, the object plane in here. Um, the lens does the Fourier transform according to Fourier optic. That's the images we have. And uh, we're utilizing two things here to get a uh, good performance. We have prior, prior information and we're using this prior information. Otherwise it would be difficult. One prior information that we're using is that we know very well what the ingoing light field is. We have uh, a well characterized SLM and we know that this performing, we know the pattern here. We know it does a Fourier transform. We know exactly where the spots are and also how much light we put in there, where our, our spots, the empty ones are used as reference beam and the, the, where the, the spots where a bead is actually trapped, where they are and how much intensity goes there. So we do have that prior information and can take these spots as uh, some boundaries, as some 
there's some um, uh, uh, things um, that you do need to satisfy to uh, enhance the convergence. And the other thing is that uh, we are have a sparse object. So we are just confining um, in, in this uh, iterative search, we are confining the object plane to a small uh, spot around the trapped particle, which we know exactly where it is. And this makes, uh, this leads to a sparsity that we have here. Um, so that's also something we have to know and we're just not trying to, to solve here for everything, but just a small square or, or, or sphere uh, or a circle around the actual particle that we want to look at. Now, um, the algorithm for the, the phase retrieval, we have to do a numerical propagation and we're looking, we, we're doing the, the steepest descent search uh, so long that until the, um, the until the, the estimated, um, the predicted field in the in the object um, in the object in the back focal plane actually matches the back focal plane image that we have. So we do it. We do a guess. It would um, do a propagation back and forth, and and uh, until we converge so that the predicted field from the numerical propagation really matches what we observe in, in, the, in the camera plane, in the back focal plane. So we need to have a numerical propagation. And uh, this is a propagator that Gregor Thalhammer has used uh, many times already. It's based on this Collins integral formulation from the 1970s. And it's kind of a, a bit of a, it combines some uh, diffraction uh, integral, so Kirchhoff integral with ray optics, it seemed to be very efficient It uh, for numerical uh, implementation here. it I don't write down the exact uh, um, expressions. It's not so important what it is. Um, there is just some phase factors, um, some, some uh, quadratic phase factors and things in convolution kernels. And an important thing is also in the implementation here for, for the propagation that we apply this for different size and grid spacings for the source and for the target plane, because they are not the same. So that is an extra thing that has to done correctly numerically, but uh, it's not a real problem. And uh, the, what is the cost function Does we, that we minimize? As I said, we want to uh, we look at the, uh, the predicted back focal plane intensity, and it should match the measured one. And um, so it looks something like this. We take these intensities and a different squared. And then uh, we have uh, chosen to do a steepest uh, a gradient descent method. And it's a, a steepest descent with a nestor of acceleration, which I think is a fairly standard idea to use here. And I guess most of you guys know much better than me how this works. So here we have the, um, this is the, the updating in, in the iteration. And here we have the gradient, which is gra the gradient of the cost function over there. And what we get is something like, uh, if you differentiate this out, out you, you end up with here. And uh, this here is, we don't have an inverse propagation, um, uh, numerical propagation operator, but the adjoint, because uh, there is no really an inverse, but an adjoint operator exists. And we do this, we plug it in here, and this works quite nicely. So with on the graphics card, um, on a data size grid of about a thousand times a thousand, we need about two milliseconds per iteration. And typically um, depends a little bit, of course, what a case exactly you have, but between 20 to 50 iterations. So it doesn't need a whole lot of iterations, So that's a typical number. We don't really have convergence problems, so no cases there, the convergence doesn't happen because we have uh, some prior knowledge about the reference field, the position of the sample, and we can use these as constraints. So we can put in extra constraints if we have problems with the convergence, and this has so far always uh, converged uh, within this about 20 to 50 iterations to the right to the right uh, solution and not, we can uh, exclude problems like a twin um, mirror image in holography or so, because we can pose in these constraints on prior knowledge that we know where things are. 
Now to show you an experimental result, this is uh, where we applied the iterative uh, uh, phase retrieval for something that we know what it should be like. And this is a orbital angular momentum uh, carrying helical beam that we put on there. So here is, uh, this is the intensity images that we see there with this typical um, um, pitchfork uh, uh, interference pattern that we get. And these uh, things here you see on the right in color, they are actual exp experimental uh, results. They're not simulations. And you can see it is pretty good, the phase retrieval for L equals plus one, minus one. And then you can go up to, if you go to uh, L equals minus 10, you see you start to have a little bit of problem where things are very fine here. Um, so up to, I would say, like something like an L equals 10, we really have no problem in reconstructing the phase properly as it should be. Um, in a first test experiment, we're looking at uh, silica beads, three micron sized silica beads, two of them that are attached to uh, a glass cover, um, to a cover slip, a glass um, surface. And um, then, so here we have an empty trap. We have two uh, spots um, that sitting at the moment on these two beads that are sitting on attached to the glass. And then we are exerting optical forces. Of course, the things don't move. We want to have a clean and, and, and constant uh, and, and, and easily to interpret situation. So the beads cannot be pried loose from the glass. They sit there, but we nevertheless can apply optical forces by moving the, uh, the, the trap across and trying, um, trying to make them follow by exerting an optical force, which is then uh, countered by the reaction force from the sticking to the glass. But we're exerting these forces we're trying to measure. And now uh, this is an example here of the what the intensity would look like. I already showed you some examples. So some of these things are, are actually artifacts, but some of the things are real, the interference pattern as it should be from all these contributions here, from the two beads and from the empty reference beam. And this is what give, is, is found by the phase retrieval. And if we do this and, uh, and compare it with the standard procedure that you would do if you just, uh, you know, look at, uh, uh, try to do it for one bead or do it for both beads, uh, for both uh, things uh, uh, at the same time, then you can see um, that in here we have in the object plane, we can do, we can optimize only with, with one, with a circular, uh, aperture that takes only into account one uh, bead here in, depicted in blue, or we can look at only the one that is uh, colored in orange here, or we can do both of them at the same time simultaneously. And then uh, we can see that a comparison of the simultaneous holographic measurement gives uh, the correct result for the both straps. And uh, if we compare it with just having one beam and, and doing a force measurement, uh, a direct force measurement, as I showed in the first part of my talk, uh, they, they agree. So we can do uh, we can do a simultaneous uh, force measurement uh, by um, by this holographic approach, which gives us the right answer. It also is, gives you the familiar curve as is one as known well known of an optical trap, where you have the hooky and linear part in the middle, and these two things that you do it at simultaneously for the two beads. Uh, at once, but just restricting where you're propagating to, um, or you do just one th uh, spot on and then do the thing with just one laser beam, one trap on uh, and compare, it gives you the same result. In the back propagation for the individual forces, the trick is just to numerically only look at either the blue region or the orange region uh, in the reconstruction. Now, uh, with uh, 10 silica microspheres, um, we have now several beads sitting here on, on, uh, the, on the glass uh, surface. And the, the uh, colored arrows, they give us these uh, beads, uh, the directions and the forces we're using simultaneously, trying to, to bring, to move these things, trying to push them away from the glass with various strengths into different various directions. 
And um, now in the back vocal plane for this case here, this is the measured. Uh, th on this side, we have the measured intensity pattern. This is the one, the results from our phase retrieval. And what we see here is in this box here, it's just the same region there where we have different layers alternate, alternating the measured a measured part and a retrieved part and a measured part and a retrieved part. So you see, this is a, a way to see that these structures, they really reproduced very well because they're going on these features, they really, they have a continuation down there. So um, it's hard to see just from the macroscopic image here, but if you do this layered uh, reconstruction and measured, and you see that we really have a continuous pattern going through so here, no disruption here, which would uh, be an indication of uh, erroneously retrieved uh, field here. So this, this works quite well. Uh, on the other end here, we, it, the same example shows you that you have here several beats, what the force uh, the forces were that we uh, that we uh, have uh, reconstructed, and you see there is actually one here, this in in a in a in a gray, uh, which uh, it looks a bit different, and uh, here we have no no really strong forces that we predict and measure. And um, the, the thing was that for this one, we had actually had um, made a mistake in, in the calculation of the traps. It was actually deep focused. It was an out of plane trap. All the other traps were in the same plane on the beats and this was displaced in the actual direction. But we thought we leave it in there to show that it's also possible to do the measurement if you're a little bit uh, uh, out of axial, uh, out of the, out of the, the plane trap that is also possible to do. Now, um, it's a new method. You always have to compare with established methods. And we did that now with floating particles that are not sticking to the surface. You can do the typical Brownian motion measurement for sm small forces, um, where you look at, the, you do a fit to, to the, um, uh, do a, a frequency analysis of the Brownian motion and fit it to these curves. And you see that we get a good agreement between uh, the prediction that we have from the new method and this Brownian motion prediction. And you can also do the, the famous uh, Stokes drag measurement that you displace the trap a little bit and the free floating particles flows in, uh, falls into the new position. It is a frictionless drag force that we have here. And, and we see if you modulate the traps, if you jump between positions, then for various sizes of, of uh, beads from 2.9 microns to 0 0.9 microns, this very well fits the prediction that we would have, uh, that we get uh, from the from the Stokes model. So there are two independent methods that we have compared our method with. And I think uh, it's important to really establish that it gives you the same answer than, than uh, very well uh, known methods. Now to apply this to an erythrocyte where we pull at various uh, spots, that's the thing I showed you here. Uh, one can then, uh, really say what force we have here pushing at that particular uh, spot on the red cells and here the results shown here. So we hope that we can apply this to measurements, for example, where one binds, uh, where has one or two entangled DNA strands with beads attached and you can have, imagine that you do have four beads or five and you pull in different directions, you, maybe uh, start to study quantitatively some uh, re DNA repair mechanisms or things like that. So I think it's exciting and we will talk to colleagues who do this sort of thing, DNA repair or the other local force measurements on larger cells where you can really probe just a particular region on the plasma membrane. Um, how, how am I doing in terms of time? Yeah, well, we, there is some uh, experimental challenges. I think I'll probably skip that. It's probably not so important. Um, if you want to get a good result, a lot of things have to be taken into account, like um, SLM calibration, characterization, crosstalk. 
In the condenser, we have a little bit of distortion and we do have aberrations in the optical systems. We also have a bit of field curvature. In the camera, there is stray light and so on. So there are some things you have to, if you really want to get to, to high accuracy, you need, if you want just an estimate, you don't have to do that. If you want to have really high accuracy, and Gregor Talhammer is the guy who really always wants the 99% correct results. So he's done a lot of things to, to push uh, the accuracy of the method, like we characterize our SLM, and we know the pixel cross talk exactly. We've written this paper here on how to estimate the pixel cross talks of our SLM. So we know very well um, the imperfections and the SLMs, and it's a phase only modulation. So, for example, one thing here is there are ghost traps that appear additionally to the actual traps that you want because. Uh, is a phase only thing and and quantizations on all these things uh, and pixel, digitize digital effects uh, in the pixelation and so it's never perfect you have these uh, ghost traps appearing and this is where the aperture stop is here and that's a picture here you also see there is a glass plate with a, an absorbing spot in the middle which actually also blocks the zero order it's also an important thing if you want to do something clean and you see these gold straps here, they can be uh, quite bad because if you put, um, if you happen to have uh, a change in, in your system and one of these gold straps, which contains considerable light, is cut off by the aperture and you underestimate something, then your face retrieval will be a little bit less precise. So that's just something I would mention. You have to take care of what you do. So this would be the back focal plane measured and the retrieved. However, if you undo something in the aperture, move it a bit or, or open or close it a little bit, so you add or you you delete one of these stronger ghost traps, then you lose a, bit, a little bit of the accuracy here. That's just something to be aware of if you want to go in the high accuracy um, region, uh, a regime where you really want to know exactly. Now, uh, how about direct torque measurement? As you know, there is also optical torque that can be applied. People, uh, um, beads can be put into orbiting. They can be brought to this orbital angular momentum on this ring or laser. They've been pushed around by the orbital angular momentum. Or you can do something like with the spin part, with the circular polarization on the biorefinition particle here from Mahalina Rubenstein Dunlop's group. They bring it to the spin. Uh, so there's the spinning uh, due to the, the spin torque. And uh, the question is, can we also do the optical torque measurement? And uh, for the torque, like the force comes about by changes in the linear momentum in the light. The torque comes about by changes of angular momentum in the light. So um, if we, the rate of, of change of the angular momentum will give you the optical torque. Now, people have estimated this from the Maxwell's theory a long time. This is just a total torque component as the uh, rate of the angular momentum set uh, um, component here only, having a, a orbital part and the spin part. And from this, you see there are these phase, azimuthal phase gradients coming up. So in comparison to the formula I showed you, how we can calculate from Maxwell's theory, the forces, this is more complicated because it doesn't contain integrals over intensity, just really contains fields needing amplitude and phase. But we already solved that problem because when we wanted to know what are individual forces on individual particles, we had to get the phase retrieval to get the complex field in amplitude and phase. So we've done that already, meaning that we are able to actually do also a direct optical torque measurements um, so here is the condenser lens that I showed you uh, uh, satisfying the AB sine condition, meaning that if we have a scattering angle like that, it is mapped into a, a, a distance from the optic, radial distance from the optical axis in the camera plane, in the back focal plane. And um, then what we need to do, we need to calculate what uh, is the, the relation between the field that, uh, that we have uh, the field that we have found by do, applying our phase retrieval uh, method, and it's done here in the um, left and right circularly polarized uh, base that makes the expression simple. And now here for the first time, we have a means 
to calculate all three components of the optical torque, X, Y, and Z, um, with this uh, retrieved field. You plug it into this formula, you carry out the integration, and it immediately gives you all three components of the optical torque So um, for monochromatic field. And uh, if we apply this to a um, dumbbell-shaped uh, system of just two beads uh, stuck together, look li like a little dumbbell here, and we're moving two traps uh, shown here on a circular, on a tight circular pass inside the particle, applying an optical force, and then we see uh, then uh, and an optical torque also to this asymmetric um, double particle, and then we can calculate the torque two ways in the in the method I showed you just in the slide before, inserting into this integral. Uh, the complex field that we have retrieved in a similar way to what we did for the forces. And just sequentially, um, when we move a spot around and we calculate it just from the, the, the lever arm and the for and a direct force measurement that we do, uh, just calculate the force on the particle and multiply with the lever arm here. And we find that these two actually agree. So this is the two methods, one calculating the force by direct force, multiplying here with this distance, with the, the length, um, and, and the other one by doing uh, the, the direct torque measurement with the formula I showed you before. So um, then knowing the theory, you can also go to, um, you can calculate uh, a spin part, if there is a spin part, if the intensity in the left uh, circular polarized spaces and the right one don't cancel out, if there is a, a circular uh, polarization component, if this isn't zero, you get a spin, a part belonging to the spin. And this can then also be calculated and pulled out from the total angular momentum, you can also uh, do the orbital part, uh, you can separate it where it makes sense. So this, with this, I come to my summary. So um, what I showed you that from interference pattern with phase retrieval, we get the complex fields, and that allows you then to use Maxwell theory and in situ calculate local forces and torques. It enables direct force measurements of objects of any shape. Individual forces at different spots on the sample can be measured. And we uh, and and uh, the same holds uh, the similar thing holds for torque also with spin and orbital contributions accessible. And now this is what where I'm now. It would look like this if I looked out of the window if it were at night already. So with this, I'm at the end. Um, thank you for your attention.